This episode, my spleen is dripping from my pants. Hey, I figured it out. There we are. We did it. Uh, yeah, welcome to Growing Up Punk, the podcast about punk rock and all of its friends. Uh, my name is David, and my oh-so crisp and clear friend is Aaron. Yeah, a a Ron in the house. a a Ron. It's funny because I just realized when I was editing. Um, oh, now what was it that you said? There was a. Uh, we were talking at the beginning of our last episode, and there was something that you said. Oh, you said AKA. Oh, Magic, Magic, Magic Johnson. Magic Johnson. And so, <laughs> but when you said it, when I heard it, like when we were recording, there was like a little bit of a glitch. And I know, like an internet glitch. And I know how often, you know, you say the whole AA Ron thing. So when you said it, I automatically filled in that you said AA Magic Johnson, which in retrospect makes absolutely no <laughs> sense because it just kind of glitched out on the K. So it's just funny because when I noticed when I was editing the episode and listening back on our audio, you say, AKA Magic Johnson, and then I repeat, ha ha, AA Magic Johnson. <laughs> like, what? Oh, well, I didn't <laughs> catch you saying that, so there we go. So there we go. It's, I mean, it is what it is. But uh, yeah, man, we're, um, we're going to continue our label series as uh, we're looking at, um, what are we looking at? Oh, Equal Vision Records. Oh, that reminded me, I was going to look, I meant to look, I feel like I have an Equal Vision Records uh, sticker kicking around somewhere. I think I got it, I don't know when I, like, I don't know why I would have it, but I feel like I have one sitting somewhere and I was waiting to put it on something. I should have like, yeah, go get it. Down and, like put it on my forehead <laughs> for this episode or something, but no, I'm not going to go get it because I don't know exactly where it is. So that's that, but um yeah, I don't know if we're supposed to talk about anything, but well, how does it feel to be so uh, bright and clear on a new camera? Uh, it feels about, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> you look like a new man. Do you feel like a new man? <laughs> it, it is nice to be able to see a nice version of myself projected. How about that? <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's that's that's perfect. I feel like it, it makes it look like you have better posture. Like, I want to slide back a little bit because you're like back a little bit. So... I've got a back pillow here, and although, although I don't, I can't. <laughs> I'm just going to spend too much time messing around. Um, well, it, it is nice because I feel like lots of times on interviews, the other person is clear, and I feel yeah. like I'm kind of like this dark shadow <laughs> that they're trying to see who who they're talking to. So this is I, nice because it feels yeah, like you, look, you can actually. You look nice, Aaron. Um, but that uh, the the dark figure sort of thing that you're mentioning reminded me. I was just thinking about this today. Uh, I don't know what brought it on. But I was, when I interviewed American Arson back last summer, I was, um, I was at my parents' house in Nova Scotia when I did this interview. And I think the RV that we took must have been, must have been when I'd taken it to the garage to get like an oil change and stuff done on it. So it was left overnight. So I didn't, cause I, cause all summer, you'll remember I recorded in the RV, right? So oh, for, yeah. for whatever reason, this specific episode, this interview that I did, I was in my parents' car out in their driveway because everyone was in bed and I didn't want to be too loud and wake people up or whatever. Right. Like, whereas like at home here, I have a space I can go record and it's no big deal. But there I, uh, I had to hang out in, in my parents' car in their driveway. And so when I'm doing this call, I was just expecting it to be like an audio, you know, call with the two guys from, from American arson. And they're like, Oh, let's do video. And I'm like, <laughs> okay like that's fine but just so you know i'm literally sitting in a car and so uh i just looked like you want to talk about like the dark shadowy figure uh it was basically just like my silhouette in this car uh and occasionally you can maybe see some faces i was making but we weren't doing video at that time so it didn't really matter they just oh yeah they just wanted to be on video but uh, i should do that sometime just like turn the lights off put my hood up just yeah. come across <laughs> super sketchy and I'm going to do an inter uh, not an interview, an episode one of these days where I'm going to set my light up behind me. And so I'm just, just going to turn all the rest of the light. So I'm just like backlit. So you just <laughs> see uh, yeah, my uh, silhouette. Your sweet backside. <laughs> not my oh. backside. My, I mean, if you're behind me, I guess you could see my backside. Who's behind <laughs> me? Dallas Green could see my backside. He's right. You can't really see him in the video. That's all he's ever wanted. Yeah. Bring, or, bring him your love. That's what or, he's saying, wasn't it? Yeah, that's actually from that record. There you uh, go. Or I guess back here, Minor Threat could see my backside or Rage Against the Machine. 
some people hanging out on my wall. Matt Good you can see my backside, although he's yeah. looking away. Anyways, this is all stuff for people who are watching the podcast, not listening to it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we're going to talk about Equal Vision Records. So why don't we, I guess, start at the beginning. Do you remember, do you actually remember hearing about Equal Vision? You know, this is one of those labels that uh, I think maybe it came later or I wasn't as associated with the label as as some of the bands. Um, yeah, I, I definitely don't r- recall like a compilation like a lot of the other labels. Um, I don't even recall what the first band on this label was that I heard. Just one of those ones, I think, kind of a few years later, um, I kind of got got accustomed to it yeah like i was i was just watching uh some stuff on their youtube channel earlier today and so i noticed in their like their little logo or what have you that it says uh it was like quality records since 1990 or something along those lines so i mean they've been been around for over 30 years now now obviously a lot of these labels you know they start and they're just like a small uh, you know, kind of like regional sort of label. So I don't right. know the deal there. I do know, I, I, I didn't like do a whole lot of research on Equal Vision, but I just know from just reading things up in the past that, uh, you know, they were, I, I guess they've got some ties to like Harry Krishna sort of stuff. I'm not sure what the background is there exactly. But are you going to say Harry Potter? <laughs> Harry Potter, you know, same Which same was deal. it? <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I will say there is some more of that coming on next week's interview from yeah. somebody that has more of that information firsthand. So Yeah, so I will just, it's, uh, it's just, they're based out of Albany, New York. They started in 1990, or it says in the early 90s, but... Uh, by Ray Capo, singer of the band's Youth of Today, Shelter, and Better Than a Thousand. Um, I just wanted to see... Uh, anyway, yeah, like you said, you kind of teased a little bit there. There is some there is some discussion with next week's interview about kind of those origins of oops, of Equal Vision. And I remember hearing that. I think, well, I, don't, I shouldn't say I remember hearing that. I remember reading that in... Uh, I want to say it was probably the book Post by Eric Grubbs, which I brought up a number of times. Either that or it was just kind of in random somewhere that I read it. But uh, I know in listening to it, to your interview, by the way, your interview next week, part two of this episode is uh, with Peter Souris of um, Be Well and Fairweather. Well, Be Well now. Is Fairweather still going? That's what I was trying to figure out. They are. Out. Yeah, yep, okay. Yep, they've been so, back for a number of years. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put this apology out there right away. I realized this mistake after, because as we're recording this, I've already uploaded the episode, like it's wait, it's waiting for release. And in the intro, I said uh, that Peter is formerly of Fairweather. And then I was uh-huh. like, as I listened, I was like, I think that's still going. And so I was going to go back and edit it, but I didn't want to like re-upload an entire YouTube video. Uh, and YouTube does allow you to go in and edit. But as far as I could tell, I could only like figure out how to like cut off from the beginning or the end, but not actually like edit a slice out. So I was just going to change it. So it said of fair weather and be well. And so uh, heads up that, that nice little error is still in there, but it is what it is. Um, bands these days like to get back together, I guess. So there it is. But yeah, I don't remember. It's funny. Cause when we were talking about, this episode and preparing for it. I was like, I don't know if I can think off the top of my head of a top five, like five favorite records from equal vision records, because they were never a label that I specifically sought out. Like we've talked a little bit, obviously about vagrant records in the, in the previous series, I mentioned how they were a label that if I saw something with their name on it, I was going to buy it. Or, you know, to the same extent, like a tooth and nail, to a lesser extent, like fat records and stuff like that. But Equal Vision was a label that I didn't really do that. But then when I went and looked at their release history, their catalog, I was like, oh, crap. Like, there's a ton of stuff on here that I was a big fan of. And I'm sure I knew they were Equal Vision releases at the time, but it was just something that I didn't necessarily hang on to over time, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, uh, I got excited about, about doing this. And, and I think for me, a lot of it was just like, you know, being familiar with the label came from, like I said, reading books and what have you, and just hearing about their kind of, um, legacy or place in, you know, like the history of, of the scene, post-hardcore scene, emo scene, whatever, like that kind of stuff. 
and so, yeah, to like go back and look and see what was actually released on on this label is uh, it was it was it was pretty exciting for me because I was like, oh yeah, dude, I I was into a lot of these. So yeah, and I think yeah, some of those bands like I don't. know. What's interesting with the label series is some of the bands, you know, on these labels that we're talking about feel like they're so associated with their label, right? Like whether it's a Tooth and Nail or Fat Records, you know, especially if it's a band that's only released all their albums on that label. Yeah, yeah. Whereas I feel like with some of these other ones, you know, bands we released one album and then went somewhere else or released on something else and then came to Equal Vision. So they're not as associated with that. So I think for myself as well even looking at my list, I only have one album that kind of came out, you know, a little bit earlier. And so, you know, I think that's kind of why I wasn't as associated with them earlier on because I just, you know, either wasn't into the bands earlier on or I just didn't know those bands were on that label at the time. Or So there's yeah. a few different variants, but yeah, definitely kind of different compared to, you know, like Vagrant and, and uh, you know, like Fat Records or some of those ones we've talked about that where those bands were so ingrained in that label that, you know, they just kind of went hand in hand. Yeah, and it is it's it is interesting because, you know, it, did, it does feel like a number of these bands, they were only on the label for one or maybe two records. And in some instances, it was like, you know, kind of like right before they kind of had that big record or you know maybe in some cases it was kind of it was afterwards or you know what have you so um it is it is kind of interesting in that respect but uh well yeah like i said when i looked at their release history their catalog i was like oh this label actually had a good number of solid releases that i really loved so um yeah i'm excited to talk about them let's get into it what was it what's uh now we just we discussed this kind of previously before before hitting record uh, I think we've gotten away from this being like definitive top fives in this order. Um, and it's more, I mean, when we get down to it, I, I think that the last albums that we each mentioned are, I think, our number one albums. But as far as the rest is concerned, these are just five of our favorites. So uh, what uh, what's up first for you? Well, let's start it off with Fair, Fairweather with their album If They Move, Kill Them, which came out uh, February 20th so of 2001. <laughs> so this is, yeah, Sit definitely. Sit still or you will die. <laughs> <laughs> this is the oldest one on the list. Uh, so I remember getting a hold of this album somehow when it came out. I, I think I probably downloaded it off of Kazaa, which, uh, so two, yeah, yeah, somewhere around there. Um, yeah, I remember it really sounding like a, a cool album it was different than most of the other stuff that i was into at that time it had a really cool mix of emo and pop pop punk indie rock but it blends together really well to create a really engaging piece of music you know at times it reminds me of saves the day stay what you are album um you know i'm guessing it's probably because they were both recorded by brian mcturnan um if i'm correct um, but similar also to Saves the Day album that it blends various elements of style throughout the album, uh, but a way, in a way that isn't confusing. You know, I was um, listening to that Saves the Day album uh, not too long ago and then listened to this one, and I could definitely kind of hear some of the similarities in there. You know, Maybe it's bands kind of coming out of a, a more punk sound or something that's starting to get you know a bit more you know emo or indie rock influences just to kind of... Um, you know, to compare those, but I, I never really got into anything after this album from Fairweather. Um, but I think they're a really cool band that that deserves a lot more attention. Yeah. Um, just to correct you, so uh, "Stay What You Are" was actually produced by Rob Schnapf. Oh, uh, okay. Um, but I will say this: this is these were my. You, you kind of touched on one of the thoughts that I had in that this record does remind me as well of "Saves the Day." And uh, it's also kind of funny because you bring up the Brian McTurnan thing um, because as I was sitting there listening to it just the other day, I was like, this sounds like a Brian McTurnan production without knowing and double checking to see who actually produced it. And then the, re the reason I was thinking that was because what it reminds me of is Identity Crisis by Thrice. Oh, yeah. Is it no, not Identity Crisis? Sorry, what's the one before the artist in the ambulance? Um, oh, what the heck! Oh, Illusion of Safety. Illusion of Safety. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Um, 
And yeah, maybe it, that's what it'll be. Yeah. And so, because what it is for me, one of the things that I've, like, when it comes to being able to pinpoint producers and their sound, for me, a lot of the times, what that focuses on is a specific drum sound. Oh, yeah. And so, so, on this... Just- yeah, on this fair weather record, the drums just remind me of the illusion of safety, like just yeah. the, the sound of them. And other similar, I think, um, not similar to this sound, but like where where that's happened is like Steve Kravak in those like mid to late '90s. You know, when he was doing the Dingies and Cooties and like slowly going the way of the Buffalo and Slick Shoes. Like there was a specific like Steve Kravak drum sound. And there's one other producer. Hold on here. Um, I want to remember get his name right uh but there's there like there's some producers where i'm just like so is it eric valentine who produced um louder now i think he also did lifestyles of the is it good charlotte oh the young and the hopeless and then yeah so like good charlotte the young and the hopeless and um taking back sunday louder now for instance they both have like the same drum sound to me yeah and so that's what was happening as i was sitting there listening to listening to Fairweather is I was like, man, this sounds like the illusion of safety meets saves the day. <laughs> so I was like, this has to be a, a Brian McTurnan thing. And, uh, yeah. And I hadn't listened to this record before, but, uh, I definitely, it was, it was out of, out of the ones I want to say that were on your list that I looked at. It was definitely the one I went back to, uh, the most, um, which is great. So do you remember, sorry, did you say where you kind of first heard this one or how that came about? Uh, yeah, I think it was just on probably a music download site. Like, I don't know if, I can't remember back then if they had like comparisons or if I had seen or heard something. I don't remember, but there was kind of quite a gap, you know, in the last you know 20 years since this came out where I didn't listen to this album. I kind of totally forgot about it. And then I don't know if it was maybe like on an old iPod or maybe even just the name popped in my head. And I was like, oh, uh, there was a band called Fairweather that I remember thinking was pretty cool. Mm-hmm. And so I looked them up on Spotify, you know, in the last while. And then, you know, through various connections, you know, like with Be Well, you know, I'd, I'd seen the name, you know, members of Fairweather. So maybe that's what it was that kind of sparked like, oh, yeah, well, I remember liking that band. Yeah. So kind of all these different things coming together to, to remind me to go back. And so now it's kind of cool to have, you know, some kind of retrospect to to put that into yeah i was sorry i was looking behind me to see i was like oh is the name fairweather on any of the, like the the show poster things behind me but it's not because they're they're a band too like i maybe i heard them at some point but i for sure remember hearing the name uh and so when you when you brought it up i was like yeah why didn't why didn't i know this but let's move into i guess this is a good chance to talk about uh the first pick that i've got because it features peter suris of fairweather as well as brian mcturnan who we just talked about and it's i can almost guarantee the newest record on the list uh that would be be yeah. well the weight and the cost so this record i, I kind of hesitated to put this one on here simply because like it it came out just last year right but it's it's a record that is so good and maybe I left something off that, you know, I had a connection to more so back in the past or what have you uh, to put this one on here. But honestly, I just think it's such a good record. And it's it sounds funny to say I could still put it on today and love absolutely every song. Well, yeah, it came out last year. But <laughs> a, a lot of times there, there are records that come out that I get super hyped about. And then, you know, you listen to it a bunch. This is I was just having this discussion actually earlier today. Uh, with I want to get I want to say I want to give him a shout out because it was quite a fun conversation that we were having uh, over Facebook of all things, which is funny because I'm not really big on Facebook. But uh, Matt Tolhurst, uh, we were messaging back and forth on on Facebook, and I was talking about how uh, with with new music. I really get into something when it first comes out, like if I really like it. But then the problem I have is that. By the time the next week rolls around, I'm looking for what is new that week, right? And right. so there's there's specific records that I can be like, yeah. So we were talking specifically about Teenage Wrist was one of the ones. And I, I said to him, I was like, oh, because he, he mentioned how I had mentioned it and then he really liked it. And so I was like, oh, thanks for reminding me of about Teenage Wrist because in all honesty, like I listen to something and like it, chances are within the next week or two, I'm kind of forgetting about it. 
which uh, is funny to think about because uh, I, I love listening to new music, right? But it's just, there's just so much out there that a lot of times it kind of comes and goes. That's like sudden waves. I went back to this week yeah. because all of a sudden I was like, what was that band that I was really enjoying not that long ago? And then, you know, I had to rack my memory. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And then go back and listen to their new record. But yeah, like, that's a be, good one. yeah. And Be Well is one of kind of like a few records that really, from the moment I heard it, was like, oh yeah, no, I, I, I'm going to really enjoy this record for more than just this week or two sort of thing, right? Um, and that's typically, like if I go off topic a little bit, that's typically how I end up buying something on vinyl is if it's something that I'm like, yeah, I've been listening to this nonstop for a while now. I think it's worth buying on vinyl, right? Which sometimes fails me because a lot of times you need to get in on a pre-order before it sells out and then if it sells right. out you're kind of out of luck for a while yeah whereas like be well be well i got lucky because and that's why i think i have an equal vision sticker because i feel like it came with that record when i ordered oh, okay it. cool um but be well they uh i remember i i, I was not in on the pre-order because it was an album that kind of i guess you had shared it with me or like one of the songs or whatever but i i didn't listen to it till it came out and it just hit me hard, and I'm sure at that time, you know, that pre that uh, first run pre order was all sold out. But they had posted after a while that, oh, hey, we found a bunch, you know, 200 or so records or whatever it was, uh, in a closet, and so I was able to snag one of those ones type thing. But, um, but yeah, no, it's just such a great album. It's got to have some of the most, I call them like desperate vocals like the way yeah. brian is singing on that record i can't yeah, compare really it cool. to anything but i know you dig the record too yeah and uh i don't know if i've gone back to it this year yet I'm trying to think yeah that's definitely one i need to because yeah i really enjoyed that one as well and um was was cool getting to talk a bit about that um with Peter um, on next week's episode. And yeah, it definitely, you know, like I've, I've said this lots of times, how it, when I have those extra perspectives, you know, when I was talking to one of the band members or listening to a podcast or something, you know, just to have that bit of extra insight, or, you know, you talking to Brian on the podcast just makes me kind of like it that much more. And uh, yeah, yeah I, 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 need to, I need to get back to that one. Yeah, it's, it's good from start to finish. Um, yeah. So all that to say, I felt a little weird at first putting it on this list because we're talking about kind of like the history of a label and our favorites over time, and it literally came out last year. Um, but that's that's that is one thing I'll say about uh, Equal Vision as I kind of took a look at the label a little bit is compared to say a label like Vagrant, who we've who we've covered, they have stuck a lot closer to kind of like what they've released in the past. I would say like up through even now, like still releasing bands that, you know, like sure they're 2020 in, in the case of be well, 2020 versions of, you know, stuff that came out years ago, but it, it doesn't feel like a label that's kind of taken a departure really um, right. from, you know, kind of where their roots are and where they've come from. Whereas in a lot of cases with vagrant, I think you can, you can make an argument that outside of say bands like thrice who I think thrice is, I'm pretty sure they're still on vagrant, at least like their last release was um, outside of bands like that. A lot of what's on vagrant that I seem to see is like different kind of stuff. Right. Which is fine too. Labels like to grow and evolve just like bands do. But um yeah, so let's get into your next pick. Yeah, so uh, this is another another newer one. Uh, this one was released on September 13th, 2019, so not that long ago. It's a band called Sleep On It, and the album is Pride and Disaster. Uh, so this one was produced by Mike Green and Kyle Black, and uh, I, I say those names because those are both um, familiar names in our scene. Uh, Mike Green's work with Pierce the Veil, Set Your Goals, Paramore, Kyle's worked with State Champs, Seaway, Newfound Glory, lots of other bands. Um, and I think that really helped this band because before this, they like they were a good band, not one I, I really went to a ton. And so when this new album came out, first of all, the artwork is really cool, so that caught my eye. Um, but I think the production team had a, had a big hand in, in making this band stand out. Um, 
for for me. So I just I, I feel like the songs are really good on this album. It's super catchy and upbeat. It's a really fun you know kind of summer album, even though it came out um, you know in the fall, I guess the beginning of September, so kind of the end of summer. But I've gone back to this album lots of times. Um, I think you know it kind of stands up to any of the the bigger kind of class up pop, pop punk bands and there's a lot to enjoy on this album I, I don't remember seeing a whole lot on it they actually ended up breaking up um soon after this album um due to various things so so that's always unfortunate when it's like oh cool i finally like this band now they put out an album that i really like and now they broke up <laughs> yeah yeah that that it's funny uh, that you say that because i feel like that was the case for so you talk about say uh like equal vision kind of coming up in that post hardcore hardcore emo whatever like boom going on i shouldn't say boom in the 90s cuz the cuz that didn't really happen until the early 2000s but like a lot of those post hardcore bands coming up they they were oftentimes like the ones that are cited as being so influential oftentimes were only around for a couple of years and then gone yeah um, true so you know which is a a big time bummer um sleep on it is a band that you know, I was, I was, again, it was one that I, I, I'd heard the name, but hadn't listened to them until, uh, I don't think anyway, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to look at their, uh, uh, their discography. I don't think I listened to them until this album. So this was pride and disaster, right? Yeah. Uh, oh, I want, dang it. I was hoping there was a uh, artwork for overexposed on their Wikipedia. Cause, uh, yeah, like I don't remember seeing seeing any of it really although they have a song called babe ruth which is pretty awesome uh, <laughs> because i like baseball and babe ruth was a baseball player um but it was it was an album that it didn't really necessarily like i i could see the uh the what's the word i'm looking for here like the i could see the attraction or whatever you want to say of of this record in this band in that pop punk scene but I think for me, a lot of like the kind of more modern pop punk sound, like they're pretty clean sounding, like as far as like vocals are concerned and production wise. Whereas like, yeah, I, f I found like for myself when getting into, you know, any pop punk that came out post 2010, I really kind of found myself enjoying more of like the, uh, I guess, raw sound whether it's you know like vocally like a the wonder years or knuckle puck or whatever where there's a little yeah, more a little more edge in the voice whereas there's i mean there's there's a ton of really good like clean pop punk bands but they just never seem to like really hold my ear and maybe it's because i don't know if this is a rabbit trail or not but maybe it's because like those bands like the wonder years and knuckle puck and real friends and stuff like that they have a little more of that uh just like that emo influence that i kind of lean towards yeah myself but yeah that makes sense but yeah this record was you know i i did i i, I enjoy doing these series sort of things because we get to see each other's list and i get to go oh i never even like thought of listening to this record sort of thing and in some cases it's i've never even heard of this band so that's awesome but uh well i don't yeah. think i knew this album was released on equal vision i just yeah so when i was going through the list i was like oh this was on there awesome i really like this album i've gone back to it lots of times so kind of worked yeah. in my favor um, another, like this isn't on my list, but I did want to shout out because, uh, actually there's a band in my local, like the Edmonton scene here that signed to equal vision records. Uh, so that's calling all captains. Yeah. And they're a band that they definitely wear their, you know, like knuckle puck influence on their sleeve pretty hard. Uh, but I remember I was at the show when they announced that they got signed to equal vision. I believe they were opening for Seaway oh, yeah. and living with lions. Um, I think that was the show I was at. Anyway, they so at that show they were like, "Oh, we signed Equal Vision Records, so we thought to kind of celebrate, we'd play a song by one of our favorite bands that was also on Equal Vision Records." And then they played an Alexis on Fire song. So, um, got to get that Canadian content in there because I yeah, believe well, so far, awesome. so far every label that you and I have discussed, we've had uh, Canadian picks. Oh yeah, yeah, that's so, cool. <laughs> and I don't. I, spoiler alert for the rest of the episode: I don't think we have any more Canadian picks, but. Um, my next album is one that I expect you to not like at all. Uh, <laughs> that would be uh, Deer in the Headlights, and the album is Small Steps, Heavy Hooves. And this record, it's funny because when I saw, when I was going through the catalog, 
the Equal Vision catalog and I saw that this album was on here, I was like, I don't think I would have had any clue. You know, every now and mm. then I come back to this album because something about it has stuck with me, but I don't think I would have had any clue that this record was on Equal Vision. Like, I just didn't associate it in that way. Um, yeah. And I was actually reminded of it when I was looking up a different album that I knew was on Equal Vision. That's kind of in a similar vein as far as like more of like an indie rock sort of sound. And that's uh, the Snake. The uh, wait is the, the, uh, the Snake the Cross the Crown or something? Yeah, like that? is that yeah. the band or is that the album? That's what I can never remember. Mander Salas is I think the name of the album, and the Snake the Cross the Crown is the band. Yeah, I think it's the yeah. band. Yeah. But so that was one that was I was tempted to put on my list, and then as I I was like, oh yeah, that's on there, and then this came out around the same time. This came out in two thousand seven, which is surprising to me, uh, because you know I would have, in my mind, it was it was a little earlier than that, but. This record was kind of interesting to me because the first time I put it on, I don't know where I would have heard it, why I would have bought it, but I bought it. <laughs> I must have like listened to it, you know, when you could sample CDs at music oh, stores. Oh yeah, I must the good have like days. somehow, some way, you know, that way or something. But I just remember first hearing the vocals on this record and thinking they reminded me of Counting Crows. And at that time, like I really like the album August and everything after. Uh, by Counting Crows, and so there was something in his vocals that reminded me of that. I'm not really sure that I think that now, but it's a for me. It's just it is a really good. I like that it's uh, the song. I think it's Grace has just like a really good build in it. Uh, I remember sharing it with a friend, and he was like, "Man, I haven't listened to music like this in forever." And I was like, "What do you mm. mean music like this?" Like he was seeing it through the lens of like listening to bands like taking back sunday and stuff like that which i was like which i was like i didn't see that but i mean they're on equal vision so that's like a fair you know kind of comparison they're going to come out of kind of like the same sort of scene or whatever right but um but yeah i was like oh all right like i heard it more as like this i would have bought this when i was definitely leaning more into like that indie rock sound um not to compare them to death cab for cutie but like when i was listening to a lot of say like death cab for cutie and stuff like that uh but yeah, did you get a chance to listen to this album? Yeah, I, I skimmed through it yesterday. And uh, I mean, yeah, like with lots of these bands, you know, I'm familiar with the name, whether it's through magazine ads or or whatever it is. And so I, I couldn't remember if I liked it or not. So I listened through it and realized that I probably wouldn't be going back to it. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's it, it's funny because I, I like, you know, when we, like you said, we, we share the list. So I always try to at least skim through to get, you know, if it's a band that I don't, haven't heard at all. Yeah. And uh, very often when I put it on, it's like, yeah, I, I, I can see why David likes this. This is a David kind of band and, you know, probably vice versa for me. And so even in that sense, you know, then it kind of makes me just want to listen to me like, okay, I wonder what David, you know, is taking from this or why he likes this. And, so I, I I could see that it's not unenjoyable to listen to, right? Um, but it just it, yeah, it wasn't something I would pick I think, to listen to. Yeah, I think when I was listening to it, I was trying to get to that point too. I was like, okay, like what what was I listening to at this time? And it's funny because this is also the time when I would have kind of been into you know like uh, early like metalcore, post hardcore sort of stuff. Uh, and then on top of that, though what I was thinking about when I was listening to this was the band as tall as lions. And Mm. now as tall as lions are even more, I want to say not melodic, but like polished in their sound, maybe like their vocals are definitely a lot cleaner, um, than say like a deer in the headlights, but just like that thing where they'll toy with kind of more dynamics and stuff like that. Like the song grace on, on uh, small steps, heavy hooves reminds me of, Oh, what's the, maybe the acrobat. Is that what it's called? Um, let's see if I can find it. Mm. Ah, will this give me something? I want to say it was called the acrobat. Uh, course it doesn't come up fine fine i was just, i was gonna try and quickly search up uh as tall as lions but i don't feel like having to dig it up so anyway i want to say the song was called the acrobat but um just where there's like a nice build in it and it's you know kind of anyway whatever i really this is this is an album that i will kind of come back to every now and then because it is a little different from most of the stuff that i was listening to i think at that time but uh yeah what's next on your list 
So yeah, we're going uh, back to back to heavy, and uh, so this is a band called Texas in July, and their album Bloodwork. So this was their fourth and final album, um, and the album was released in 2014. And this is the band's only album to feature the vocalist on this album. Uh, this is one of my one of my favorite metalcore albums. It's very much in the same vein as uh, bands like August Burns Red, you know, in technicality, aggression, and they also have an awesome drummer as well. And uh, I got to see this band live before they broke up in 2015, and and seeing them live is kind of what solidified them as a favorite for me. Uh, they were awesome live. Like I said, the drummer was amazing. He's he's a drummer I've been following for a while, and so it's cool to see him in person. I've gone back to this album many times and always find something to take away from it. You know, not necessarily anything super special um, about it, but it's just a really solid metalcore album. And there's not really a ton of bands like this on Equal Vision, uh, and so even that in itself kind of stands out a bit for me. Yeah, this was um, this was definitely a band that when I listened to it, I was like, okay. It actually kind of painted a little bit of a picture of what I would go on to assume some of the other bands on your list sounded like, and we'll get into that in a few minutes. But uh, but yeah, I was kind of I don't, we we've talked at length before where like metalcore for the most part isn't really you know, is it really my thing? And I, I realized a few minutes ago, I said, you know, I was like, oh, probably at this time, 2007, I was listening to early metalcore. And probably more what I mean is like melodic hardcore. Yeah. Um, you know, bands like, even that though would have been before that when I think about listening to bands like Hope's Fall and stuff like that. But um, maybe in 2007. Anyway, whatever. It's neither here nor there. Uh, but yeah, so this record, I didn't, I much like with uh, Deer in the Headlights for you, I kind of skimmed through it real quick. Um, but uh yeah, you know, I like the, that we when we cover these labels, I kind of get to learn that oh, there's like so many different sides to some of these labels, including like Victory Records, right? Like yeah, for sure. How the lists that we had of bands on Victory Records were so different. Now, Victory was one that I was also very much aware of. You know, like a lot of the bands that you picked, like just that that heavier side, like that was it wasn't a surprise, but it's just kind of fun to go through and be like, oh, dude, like I can pick Deer in the Headlights. And then you can follow that up with Texas in July, both on the same label, but very different sounds. Uh, yeah. So good on, good on them for that. My next pick, uh, I, I recently saw, so there's a podcast, I think it was five songs or less, and they'd posted asking, you know, what's a band that's a one-hit wonder for you? And I didn't really, like, come to think about that. I could say Deer in the Headlights. They did have another album, but I never really got into it. But this band has many albums, and i only really like this one album i've listened to some of their other albums and just could never get into it that'd be coheed and cambria and the album is in keeping secrets of silent earth three i don't know what that's supposed to mean it makes it like to me that makes it sound like there's in keeping secrets of silent earth one and two but i know that this whole coheed and cambria thing they tell like this one really long story i've never really taken the time to dive into it i can appreciate um I can appreciate the fact of like literally making your band a concept. In fact, I think just a couple of years ago, they released an album that was like the first album outside of that whole concept. So like, that's impressive. Uh, it's, I've never really gotten into that though. And as far as like digging this band, this is the only album that I, I did have a live album that I think was in like a free bin or something where they played a few songs off of the album that came before this one. Um, but this album in particular, when it came out, I bought it and I absolutely loved it. And it's very different from any other anything else really that I listened to then and now and before that. Like it's uh I don't know I don't know if like I don't know if they're a prog rock band. I don't know if that's fair to say or not, but they definitely they definitely get theatrical and adventurous at times. Um this it's funny because I listened to this album a ton and it reminds me of driving through the mountains, uh, like late at night to go to Vancouver Island. And at a time when, you know, we just had a, like a CD player in the car, I didn't have a phone or anything to like play music. And so I remember having to, I would, I listened to this album a couple times in a row because I didn't want to wake my wife, Lindsay up. She was sleeping. 
and I didn't want to wake her up to like get the CDs. So I just looped through this one, which is impressive because it's yeah, 70, it's 70 minutes long, right? That's but, crazy. Yeah. It also takes a bunch of time for you. But, um, I also remember seeing, I only saw Coheed and Cambria once and it is the biggest letdown of a concert I've ever experienced. Uh, they played at warp tour and I was, was that the there. Calgary one? Yeah. They were, I was like pumped to see them. Like they were one of the reasons, you know, I bought tickets that I was like, okay, I'm going to see Coheed and Cambria and no effects played right before them. I remember that yeah. because, uh, cause, cause first and foremost, they're kind of over getting set up on their stage and no effects is playing. And fat Mike says, you know, he's like something like we got one more song left and then like fucking rush or whoever's up next is like what he says. Right. Like, yeah, just yeah. kind of like <laughs> brushing off Coheed and Cambria. And so the first thing Coheed comes out on stage and Claudio, the singer, uh, first and foremost, he's been drinking all day, so he's like just a mess. And he's like gets in front of the mic. He's like, first of all, we're not rush. Fuck that guy. <laughs> it's like first thing he says. <laughs> and then they launch into their songs, and he is so drunk, like he's forgetting lyrics. He's messing up like licks. He's just like not playing well at all. There are some guys who can get out there and they can just like absolutely tear it up, and it doesn't matter how much they've been drinking. But he was a mess, right? Yeah. And so the, the crowd is clearly like kind of upset, annoyed and not really having it. And so they're like booing and yelling stuff at them. And, you know, as would often be the case, I don't know about Warp Tour in general, but Calgary Warp Tour was always like when, when the crowd didn't like people, they got really stupid and they would just start throwing water bottles and stuff. Like mm -hmm. I remember one year seeing, I can't remember who it was, but it was, uh, it was a, like a hip hop artist and he was up there. And so he's like very much out of the norm of what's happening at warp tour and so people were just not happy he was playing main stage they weren't happy about it so they were like chucking water bottles at him and stuff i was like this is a bit much like come on guys if you don't like it there's literally multiple stages going yeah, on that exactly. you can go see like get your head out of your asses but whereas like with with coheed i was like i could kind of get it a little bit because like people were probably like wanting to see this band yeah and they were pissed off because he's up there just screwing it up because you know he's gotten into the into the whiskey too much or whatever it was but so he's like taunting the crowd because like someone threw a water bottle and they like missed him he's like that's why you guys don't play baseball here in canada you can't throw it's like that's just <laughs> that's just dumb yeah <laughs> like come off it but um were you ever into coheed so this is uh, a cool moment because this doesn't happen often, but I was at that warp tour at that show. I can remember no you effects. Threw, and you threw the first water bottle, didn't oh, you? Oh yeah. <laughs> no, you know, I, I don't remember being into Coheed then. Um, yeah. but when, when you said that, I was like, Oh, I'm pretty sure I, I've seen them live. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know what? They're, they're a very unique band. There's a lot of different, kind of ways you could take it or things to take away. I remember this album being really big. There was people that were, you know, this was a band that you, like you were either super into or you just couldn't stand. And, you know, I can see both sides. Very talented band, lots of really cool guitar playing and, I mean, awesome vocalist when he's not drunk. Um, so I, I was skipping through this album yesterday and I was like, oh, yeah, I remember these songs and, you know, they're kind of coming back to me. You know, it's 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 definitely much for me. You know, like it is a little kind of mystical feeling or oh, yeah, 100%. you know like i don't know if he's singing about dragons or not but it's almost <laughs> like that like balance of like this could kind of be like power metal like dragon force yeah. you know kind of stuff but yeah. you know but it's got more of kind of that you know prog rock but kind of post hardcore even in there yeah. too and like there, there's definitely enough in there that i could listen to it and be like oh, okay there's some really cool parts in here you know it's catchy enough it's not so prog rock that it's just like all over the place and yeah. you know so yeah it's a long album but I, I think there's there's enough for kind of various types of music fans to take away from it yeah it's I don't know. Like I, I say all that, you know, stuff about that, that show. And in saying that I still really enjoy this album. Um, but in a similar way, like the, the kind of like fantasy sort of like, they are really diving into, uh, yeah. Like that whole fantasy world thing. I had a, I had a buddy played drums in a couple bands with me. I don't know if he was into Coheed and Cambria so much. Like, I think he probably was a little bit, but it always felt like a band that he would really dive into. Mm. He was a big fan of Rush. Maybe that's why it always felt like he, he could really <laughs> dive into this band. But, um, 
Yeah, it's it's funny because they have so many records. I don't know how many in total, but they have a lot of records. And to this day, this is the only one that I really like. Mm. Um, and this, like that that song, I don't know what it's called off the top of my head, but the one that's like "Good Eye Sniper," like that one will get stuck in my head out of nowhere. All and it just reminds me, takes me back instantly to like those years, two thousand three or so. Like it, it reminds me of. I talked about like driving through the mountains, but a lot of it yeah. also just like. Um, like that first year being on my own, living with my roommates, living in the basement or whatever, right? Like, uh, so there's there's a lot of kind of cool memories tied to it in regard, like tied to it with with stuff like that. But um, yeah, just like the worst show I've ever been to. And I think what what made it worse was he kept saying, "Don't worry, I'll be better when we come back in the fall." And then they never came back in the fall. So, <laughs> well, that's just an yeah, that's an annoying thing about. I mean, people are coming to pay you to. You know, to play, this is all you're doing that whole day is you're playing for half an hour. Like, yeah. come on. I, I get you're sitting around all day with nothing else to do, but, yeah, yeah. you know. Um, but, yeah, anyway, is. screw that guy. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's not true. That's not true. But what's next on your list? So uh, another band that uh, is maybe a little bit more unknown, a band called Life on Repeat. And this is the album Struggle and Sleep that was released in 2011. So this is a band that I had heard very little about back then and even kind of still. Uh, I find them to be a very underrated band. I love this album and the album that followed as well. They didn't necessarily have you know, a super unique sound unto their own, but I felt like what they did, they did it very well. You know, They were a post-hardcore band, but with a lot of pop sensibilities. For me, they stand out from a lot of the other bands that would be considered their peers. So it's a shame that they never seem to kind of get more recognition. Uh, the songs were well-crafted, catchy. Uh, the, the album was put together really well. I, I always enjoy going back to this album. Uh, I, I have a, a tank top from them that I bought yeah. years ago. Yeah. And I still wear it every summer. And so every year I'm reminded of them because of that. I, you know, I've got a few band tank tops that I still have. And that's when I put it on, it's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to go back and listen to this album. And I don't know, it's just kind of, a again, another one I didn't realize they were on Equal Vision until I was looking through the list, and I was like, oh, man, I really like this album. So I went back to it this week and listened to it, and there's still lots of really good songs on it, and I don't know what happened to them after. Like I said, I didn't really hear a whole lot about them, but yeah. really like this album. I don't know if I, um, if I knew this band like the name is for sure familiar and i'm wondering if like a lot of that was just you know hearing their name come up uh just in the scene going to shows and whatever right like friends who are into them but i, I like i definitely had never listened to them as far as i know prior to uh prior to this but um yeah it's it's funny because life on repeat sounds like a band name that they took from like a a like a, a teen melodrama sort of show yeah <laughs> you know like that's this what it just that's, feels like it's life on repeat. life on repeat man like get a get a girlfriend get dumped you know <laughs> whatever it's just life on repeat but uh no it's it's that's cool stuff i i don't have much to say about them because i just skimmed through the album much like happens you know this the next album like on my list that i was trying to figure like this one could very well be my number one uh but right now it's it's not and there's reasons for that but it's uh saves the day through being cool and this it's i won't lie this record i got into saves the day with stay what you are and that record is different from this record and as is the case with a number of bands like when i mentioned with uh on our vagrant episode with the band hey mercedes you know, I had said, like, I listened to Hey Mercedes, and then people were like, oh, have you ever heard of uh, Braid, which is, you know, what Bob Nana and these guys come from, and then you kind of learn that way. Whereas, like, Saves the Day with uh, Stay What You Are, you know, obviously people weren't saying, oh, have you ever heard of this other band? It was like, yeah, but you should hear the record that came before this. And I think a lot of times this is the record that gets cited as, like, being kind of their classic record and maybe that's just because the the difference between this record and stay what you are not it's not drastic but like the, it definitely you know there's a shift that's happening yeah. in the sound right whereas this is a lot more a lot more straight up in that you know like pop punk emo sound and it is such a good record and the thing i like about this record is that chris conley like his his lyrics 
while the presentation isn't, you know, not that the presentation of Stay What You Are is necessarily dark, but they definitely got a little more into like the minor chords and, yeah. you know, kind of different sounds in that regard. Whereas like on this, like I said, it's a lot more kind of straightforward, but his lyrics are still dark or yeah. violent. He's, he's a very violent lyricist. Yes, yeah. <laughs> like, and sometimes I'm kind of like, that's, that's what you came up with? Like dragging a saw across someone's thigh? Like where, what are you... Maybe I need to look further into that to figure out exactly what his metaphor is there. But, you know, sometimes you just hear the lyrics. You're like, okay, I mean, you made the choice. But he's also, he's, he's a very unique songwriter. And uh, I just kind of wish, you know, we talk about bands all the time where you kind of wish they they sort of stayed, you know, kind of, they, they sort of stay what they are. Um, but, because like I, I say that in the in the, in the sense that saves the day now is just so different and like not good. Like you can make an argument for some bands changing, but at least like doing what they do well, if that makes right. sense. Whereas yeah, I just like a thrice or something, right? Yeah, yeah. Like, and I just can't see. And I, I'm sorry to anyone who likes the you know like saves the day stuff that their last couple of albums. I just don't get it. Like it's just so weird, and there's just nothing really captivating about it for me. But you go back to these records, um, and they're just like they are so good, right? Like, and I know a lot of people didn't like "Stay What You Are," or I shouldn't say that. I just remember people hearing like like hearing people say, "But this other one was so much better," right? Like, um, and I I don't know, they're just different. But this this record, the reason why I don't know if I put it at my number one is simply because I don't. I don't think like I, I got into this record so much later, if that makes sense. Yeah. Right. Like, um, because, you know, at the time when I would have been discovering stay what you are by saves the day versus this, like you had to go buy that stuff. Right. Like, so for right. me here through being cool, I would have had to go spend the money on it, which is not a bad thing by any means, but it was just, I always ended up buying something else, whether it's cause through being cool, wasn't available or it was just something else that I was going to buy, whatever the case. But, um, this was a record that you wanted to bring up or you wanted to mention when we did vagrant. Cause you're like, I wish this record was on. Yeah. <laughs> vagrant. Yeah. Yeah. This is, this was a big one too. I it was just, as you're talking, there's lots of memories coming back to, to listening to this and doffing with my friend Jess and, you know, the lyrics come to mind because I remember us reading through the lyrics and just being like, this is different than, you know, a lot of the other bands we're listening to. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, the, it, it's interesting that, you know, um, Can Slow Down, that was the, the one before this, right? Can Slow yeah. Down? Is that? Yeah. yeah. So that one was like pretty much like straight fast punk. Yeah. And then this album came out and it definitely still had those punk sensibilities, but... You know, like you said, some of those maybe darker chords or different song structures, uh, but still, but still catchy. And then "Stay What You Are" um, definitely, at least for me, kind of went a little too far into the just kind of like the rock or whatever you want to call it. You know, yeah. I kind of lost interest at that point because it kind of felt like it lost that kind of punk energy or whatever that that I really liked with that album. Uh, so yeah, it's it's definitely my favorite Saves the Day album. I kind of stopped listening to them, you know, after this one. Stay What You Are was still in rotation, you know, whether it was with friends or, you know, there, there's definitely still some good songs in there and I enjoy it. But as I've listened to this one the last few months, yeah, it's a very unique album. It doesn't really sound, at least to me, like a lot of other kind of punk albums that I was into at that time. Yeah, and I was, I was it definitely takes a lot of a lot of influence from like that post hardcore emo sort of stuff that was going on with bands like the promise ring um where you know they kind of got to a point where they were a lot more because i think a lot of those bands kind of started out a little more uh i don't angular is not the right word but just like a lot more say like time signature changes and just like different yeah. kind of syncopated stuff and then like with a band like the promise ring for me, they at, at some point in time, they really kind of like, well, they didn't completely get away from those sort of things. They just kind of like smoothed it out a little bit and really kind of leaned into their pop sensibilities in some of their songs and on some of their albums. And I think saves the day really kind of did that, but like kept a lot of like that, that like, like, I guess just punk rock energy, right? Like in those yeah. first couple of albums 
And it's funny because Can't Slow Down, I recently uh, found that one at a thrift store. And like listening to it, I like it because you can hear Saves the Day, but it's also so raw still. Like, yeah. And I say still, is. like obviously it was their first official, like, I don't know, I'm sure they had a demo or something or maybe some EPs before that, but like their first kind of like full length album. And it, it it's so raw. And then you hear this and it's like, okay, they refined that sound a little bit, right? Like they they kind of really started smoothing it, but still keeping that energy. And then they just like shifted with stay what you are. But for me, they shifted in a great way. Like I, I still love that record. And, uh, it's, there's just so much about it. That's so good. And I know when like Roger, uh, picked it as like his number one on vagrant records, like bar none, no question about it. Yeah. I was like, yeah, I get it. I get it. Right. So it's just interesting to have. I like, I like having those kind of two different sides. And then they kind of like start making that change. In Reverie, I still liked. Um, I think that was the next one with the blue cover. Yeah, uh, sounds familiar. That was like, okay, it, there's there's some change that's happening here that I'm not 100% on board with, but it was still pretty good. And then from there, I've just kind of lost them for the most part. But but this record, it's one that's kind of growing on me in time because like I said, I kind of came around to it years after the fact, right? Like, so... But uh, here we are. It's it's definitely worthy of being on this list, and I debated putting it yeah, at, for sure. at number one mainly because um, I think it's more important of an album than what is going to be my number one, essentially my number one pick. But um, that's not what we're here for. We're here to talk about the records we love most, I guess. Right? Yeah, so there, it's up there. there but so what's your next one? So this is my my number one. Uh, this is the one that I have listened to. The most. This is my number one, right? I'm just making sure. Yeah, that's, yeah. Okay, yeah. You told me it was. <laughs> well, yeah. You were. I just. I couldn't tell if you were looking like. Oh, you still have more than one album left. No, no. <laughs> so yeah, this is my number one because it's the album out of these I've listened to the most. It's also the band that I've been listening to uh, the longest. I guess. I mean, Fairweather came out first, but yeah. anyways, this this band. Uh, yeah, they've been a long-time favorite for me, you know, as far as hardcore bands go. They released three albums on Face Down before signing to Equal Vision in 2016, and they released the album Cold uh, in May of 2017. Uh, Cold earned Gideon their best-received and most successful Wait, hold album. On. Yeah, hold on. you're jumping into it. You didn't. You gotta. You gotta. You gotta tee us up so I can play the song. What's your favorite album on Equal Vision? Oh, the album Cold by Gideon. <laughs> Cold by my favorite band that I found in my hotel bedside table. Is that right? Is that where you discovered them in the hotel bedside table? Yeah, I wish. Yeah, <laughs> they, they leave them. They, would, how much better would life be if instead Every of Gideon's hotel. Bibles <laughs> in hotel bedside tables, it was copies of Gideon albums? <laughs> well, I don't know if that would uh, bring any more people to the Lord or not. <laughs> I don't know, but there'd be a lot more headbanging. That is for sure. Yeah, there we go. Oh, man, where was I? Yeah, so what's interesting about this is this was their best received and most successful album to date. So I don't know if that was due to branching out to Equal Vision or just because it's a really good album. And there's there's a lot of hardcore that I'm not super into, mm -hmm. uh, but I've always loved Gideon's approach to writing heavy music. They do it in a way that's very memorable and catchy while still remaining heavy. This album is my favorite of theirs. I've listened to it so many times. I never get sick of it. And I, I think it's hard to write hardcore songs that stand out and stick with you. And there's, you know, in my opinion, few bands that can do it. And I think that Gideon is one of those bands. So good job on them. Yeah. We had a brief discussion about this band. Cause, <laughs> so I said, I think the only one I haven't, like, um, I haven't gone through at all on your list was, was Gideon. And I said, because I'm assuming I'd heard the name somewhere. And now that you say they were on face down, I was like, okay, maybe that makes a little more sense. I've probably seen them come up in, in that kind of regard. And so I was like, I'm, I'm assuming they're heavy and I'm not really going to like them that much. And then, so you sent me, I can't remember the name of the song, but it's uh, with Brian from knocked loose. I'm assuming you sent that song because you know, I like knocked loose. That was, that was my yeah, assumption. Yeah. yeah. And so I just remember I, I said, I texted you listening to it being like, Man, every time I hear Brian from Knocked Loose like screaming, it sounds like his voice is about to break every time. Like it's something else. But and by the way, I uh did you watch the the video I sent you the other day? 
No, I didn't, Jeff. I don't, I don't, it was at some festival early 2020, I think they were playing, and the venue looked like it must, like, it was either just like this warehouse or it was like an indoor skate park, but it was just packed full of people going nuts. It was knocked loose. It was, it was good stuff, but, um, what did you think of that song that I sent you? I, I liked it, but this is so, sorry, this is what I was trying to get to is that I find Gideon, um, I, I want to explore them a little bit more because, you know, I, what were the words that you said? You said like they are, they're not necessarily melodic, but they write catchy hardcore or something. Yeah. Like that is the way you put it. And I'll say this right up front. I do like that they definitely kind of lean more into like the, um, more of like hardcore punk, like beat down hardcore sort of stuff versus like metalcore, at least in the songs that I listen to. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. But what, is always a barrier for me. And this is the discussion we started having is this wave of bands. And I don't know where and when this started, but where they're like, all of their riffs are just like syncopated quantized riffs. So I don't mind the syncopation part, but the, 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 like the, the quantizing that they do in the studio where they basically take all of your guitar and drum parts and whatever and move them so they're perfectly on the click so they're just like robotic kind of like takes a little bit out for me when I first hear it every time I'm like oh this is cool listen to how tight they are right like and they're like doing these things and who knows maybe Gideon is this tight it's entirely possible but what it does for me in listening to it is it kind of like removes me from the experience a little bit because what I'm looking for, I think, in music like that, and I mentioned this in a text message, is like the like chaos of hardcore, right? When you go see those bands live, there's no way they are playing quite that tight, right? Because they're not like they're they're playing as humans and not as machines, essentially, right? So you get like more of that energy and you get some of that chaos as it were not necessarily chaos as in like listening to like the chariot or something like that where it's just pure chaos but just like it's a little more alive right and so that's like the big drawback for me in listening to something like this and really getting into it and because i think because their riffs are so like right like that sort of yeah As opposed to like, sometimes they will open up and it really like drives home the point. Like when they do like open up, you're like, oh yeah, here we go. Right. But just like the riffs that they're playing, it's just hard for me to really, um, get into it because like, I I think it just, to me, it's a little robotic, but I can hear as this, like listening to this band, I'm like, I do actually really want to like this. It's just, I get distracted. I think is probably the best way to sum it up in just like hearing and going like listen to how just like in sync with each other they are um i don't know i feel like an old man yelling at a cloud when i say that and i roll my eyes (laughs) there's a there's a guy on youtube a youtube channel and uh, this guy's a producer he's been a producer i want to say since like the early 90s uh his name's rick beato and he does he has these great series where he'll like uh he calls it like the "What, what makes this song great series or whatever and he takes songs And the very first one he did was all the small things by Blink-182, right? And so what he does is he, like, breaks down the songs and, you know, like, what they're doing in the chord progression, what they're doing with the melodies and the harmonies. And then he also has, like, he'll, he'll like, solo specific tracks and be like, check this out. They layered this underneath. You don't even notice it at first. And then, like, like listen, like, just all this kind of stuff. A real, like, in-depth look at the songs. And he's had a couple videos where he talks about quantizing and how it just, like, really takes the human element out of music. Mm. And I was like, when I, I just know when I watched those videos, I was like, yeah, okay, whatever. You know, like, sure. I get what you're saying. Like you like your old bands that, you know, when they're, you know, playing it live in the room together and that's all cool too. And normally I don't have a problem with it. It's just when it's like they construct their entire songs around these riffs that are passing off is like super tight. And it's just, like I said, like it's, it just feels like it's all put together um, by robots, <laughs> but but I do really want to like it. That's, yeah, I, again, I feel like this seems, seems really weird to say, but well, I will back that up by saying the last time I saw them live after this album, they were opening a tour, 
and for me, they by far surpassed the other bands. Yeah. Um, on the show, they were extremely tight. You know, I don't know if they were playing to like a click in their in their right. in ears or whatever, so that it was you know still super on time. But I don't yeah. know. I I they they pulled it off. I mean, they've been playing for a lot of years now, and so. You know, they and they've got an awesome drummer too, so he really knows how to kind of be that backbone and keep yeah. that you and know, part beat of it, going. Part of it could be even just in like the guitar tones that a lot of these bands choose. Like I I have this hard time kind of describing or explaining, but I, I actually had the same thing I said about an album that I absolutely love though, which is crown shyness by trash boat like when i hear the guitar tone on that i'm like there's just something about it that doesn't seem real <laughs> mm. <laughs> like and yeah. so a lot a lot of these like you know like metalcore hardcore bands and whatever i don't know if it just like jumps out even more when it's just so kind of tight and like i said like the syncopation and and whatever i i think what it is is like when i like music to get a little i often use the word angular and i can use that in like different ways whether it's just like kind of um like atonal sort of sounds or chords that are kind of gnarly or a bit raunchy or when it's just not you know they're not just playing straight quarter or eighth notes right like they're they're starting to syncopate a little bit and get off those you know those straight notes and so and and, and but not just like doing it like straight forward but like i said earlier when i went yeah, yeah. you know like i think i like when that stuff comes out of nowhere and is a part of a song, but when it becomes the whole song, I just kind of get a little wishy-washy with it. I yeah, suppose, and I, I mean, lots of music I listen to is like that. You know, a lot of the yeah. metal and kind of. So maybe I'm just used to it, or sure, totally, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I don't disagree. But if it's done, I don't like it if you know, for one, the drums are programmed. Yeah. You know, or if they're if it's not like done well production wise, but I don't know, this album sounds great when I put it on, like it's yeah. it sounds huge. So to me it just kind of keeps me in that head banging mode and Yeah, yeah. And if it means anything, like I added this album to my Apple Music collection because I'm like I do want to actually go in and listen to this because yeah, there's a there's lot of stuff like... happening in it that I do really like. Um it's just like I think part of it is sitting down and taking that like listen your initial listen to go okay what do i think of this right yeah. like and just sitting there and thinking about it in that regard what is my first impression of this as opposed to just being like putting it on and letting it go now uh, obviously also like full honesty we've talked about this when it gets into like metalcore sort of stuff a lot of, like we talked about this at length with august burns red August Burns Red is a band where I'm like, I just feel like I'm being assaulted from like the start of the very first song all the way through the end because it just doesn't stop. Right. Yeah. I don't I don't feel that with this. And maybe that's why I'm like, OK, I want to kind of explore this a little bit more. But yeah, and there's not as much lead guitar shredding yeah. as August well, Burns that, Red. So it's a bit easier was, to digest. That was almost the only note I was going to write as I was like, I'm a few songs in and no solos yet, which again. I don't have a problem with solos. I just don't like them when they're in every song and they're like three minutes long. I'm like, yeah. okay. <laughs> like, cause I like, I like listening to really technical guitar work because I sit there going, I don't get it. Like, uh, the band, I think it's Polyphia. I don't know if you ever listened to them, but oh, yeah, yeah. that dude on guitar, uh, well, actually all those guys in the band are just ridiculous yeah. at how good they are. Right. Like, and so I'd be curious to see if they can play their stuff live as clean as they play it. Uh, because, again, like, I know I've, I've seen videos of that guy where I think he, like, will write something in MIDI and then figure out how to play it on guitar. Wow. <laughs> He's like, okay, this sounds cool. Now how do I do it? Right? Like, uh, and so I'd be curious to see, like, I don't know a whole lot about them and I haven't listened a ton, but, like, stuff like that. I really enjoy. So like guitar solos, it's just something about it where I'm like, ah, and maybe it's because it's been like forever. Like the way that dudes have shown, like how good they are at guitar is when you bust into that guitar solo. Right. Where it's yeah. like, now there's a lot of music where it's like, it's kind of built around that, but not like wanking on solos, but just doing other crazy technical stuff. Anyway, I don't know. I could go on, go on for hours about that, but um, let's get into, I'll get into my final pick. And, yeah, let's hear it. Then we'll wrap it up. So my final pick, like I said, I don't, uh, okay. It's armor for sleep. What to do when you are dead. Oh yeah. And this record is a very weird record for me. 
because I don't, I'm not convinced that it's actually my number one Equal Vision record. But here's what's special about this record for me: the first couple songs are super solid, and they've got great hooks. Uh, that's like Car Underwater, I think, and I forget what the next one is. Um, but anyway, they're like these these super kind of hooky songs, and the whole the album is a is a is a concept album about a guy who dies like in a car crash or whatever. And then it's just him floating around as a dead person, basically spying on the person he loves. It's not creepy at all. What are you talking about? But um, what I love about this record is it starts off pretty strong and then it kind of gets a little like, I, I, I alluded to this a little bit in our Vagrant Records episode when I think we were talking about Hot Rod Circuit. And I said, it's an album that, with Hot Rod Circuit, it's an album that when it ends, I want to put it back on. Yeah. And you kind of like forget about time as it passes, like as you're listening to it. And this record is similar in the sense that it'll be put on and I'll like stop paying attention to it after the first few songs because it kind of goes from being strong to being okay. And then the closing song comes in and it's since been surpassed for me. But at the time when I first heard this song, because they bring a hook back that they sang on like the second song on the album or whatever. Oh, cool. And all of a sudden, and, but when they bring it back, they like make it so much bigger. Hmm. Now there's like a choir singing it and it's just like going off. Right. And the lines are like, don't believe what they tell you when they say it rain. Oh, I, it talks about raining in heaven on the day that you die or something like that. Um, Oh, I think it's don't believe that the weather is perfect on the day that you die. I can't remember. Uh, but, um, yeah. So, anyway, when they do this, when they bring this back in, it's just, like, absolutely massive. And as soon as the song is over, I'm like, I need to start this again. And then it starts again, and you listen to the first couple songs. And it's the same thing. And and then yeah. and then it starts disappearing again because you know Oof. it kind of gets into these songs where I'm like okay these are like they're fine and actually when you pay attention to them they're good songs but they're not like it's not an album where you like hear one song you're like man that was good next song oh that was good oh oh that's good oh that's good oh that's it right. gets to this point where it just starts flowing together and um, yeah, I don't know I also just learned by looking at their Wikipedia apparently there is a pre gap hidden track called one last regret which I'm in- interested to know if I've ever heard it. <laughs> Because I don't know that it comes up on Apple Music or anything, and I don't remember rewinding back on the CD to listen to it. But, um, but yeah, with that closing song, every single time I'm suckered back in. Uh, similar to the Wonder Years would do it years later in a like a much larger way uh, with "I Just Want to Sell Out My Funeral" to finish off the Greatest Generation where they like sing a hook from almost every song on that record. Mm. Right. Uh, whereas this one is just one hook, but it's so memorable, even though I can't remember the lyrics off the top of my head. And and it's so big that you're just like, okay, I'm, I'm coming back. Like we're doing this again. You're dragging me along again. Yeah. Well, were you ever into armor for sleep or this record? Well, that's, that's a cool way to end an album and I should go back and listen to it again. I, um, yeah, I did skim through it. Yeah. I mean, I'm familiar with this band enough, you know, I for sure saw their artwork around and thought it was cool. And, uh, yeah, I wasn't ever like super into it by any means, but I think it is one of those bands that could be put on and I could, could enjoy it in the right, uh, scenario. Yeah. They're so like, they had the album dream to make believe, which came out prior to this one, which had a couple of really good songs. That would have been where I first heard them. I must've had, I want to say I had an equal vision sampler of some sort. Because I never owned Dream to Make Believe, but I knew a few songs off it really well from, like I said, it must have been a sampler maybe, um, or maybe it wasn't a straight-up Equal Vision sampler. It might have been another compilation album that they were on. But uh, when this one came out, I bought it. And I actually also like their album that came after this, Smile for Them. It's it might it's possible that it's got stronger songs on it, but as like a, a, an album from start to finish, well, A, Smile for Them, I don't believe was on Equal Vision, but what to do when you're dead is just tied so well together. I think being a concept album and it came with like a little like booklet, like it had the CD book and then another little booklet that like was like a little thing of like different things you can do when you're dead. (laughs) If I remember correctly, but 
Yeah, I saw Armor for Sleep. They opened for, uh, they played a show with Taking Back Sunday and Under Oath. Oh, cool. Um, it was really, yeah, really good show. And they they were great. But uh, and the, the album Smile for Them, they have a song. I think the song's called Williamsburg. And it always gets stuck in my head whenever I hear someone talk about Williamsburg. Because I think like the line in the chorus is something like, you will all die in Williamsburg. And I'm like, so like anytime, uh, I believe Williamsburg is like in New York City. And so it's just like this thing that comes up every now and then I, I hear it come up and I'm like, oh, and that song comes back to my, comes flooding back. But yeah, man, Armor for Sleep. They're, uh, they're an interesting band because I don't, I don't know that they ever offered anything that was better than anybody else, if that right. makes sense. Yeah. Like they, their vocalist was fine, not necessarily great. Um, and like musically they were again, fine. They didn't write any like huge memorable riffs. They just did something that they packaged it together that I think, you know, I'm not surprised that they never blew up if that makes sense. Yeah. But I also thoroughly enjoy them. And and, you know, this album, I think they put a lot of thought into and that's cool. Yeah. Yeah. It definitely seems like something like you said, thought put into it. So I mean, there's lots to take away and probably an album you like you need to listen to kind of over and over, you probably won't listen to it at once and kind of get, yeah. take away everything that the band kind of hoped for you, so. Yeah. Well, now I'm going to go listen to Gideon. I'm going to try and fall asleep listening to Gideon, so wish me luck. <laughs> yeah, you might want to put headphones in for that. Uh. Why headphones? <laughs> Why headphones? I'm just going to, like, turn it up. My wife can put up with it. She'll learn Okay, to fall well, there you go. Let me now, know how that, that goes. I think that'll do it for this one, though. So uh, make sure you follow us. I don't think I said it off the top, but uh, go follow us on our social media at Growing Punk Pod. Uh, that's Twitter and Instagram. You'll find our personal links there, too. Uh, growingpunkpod.com is our website. And you can all, you can find merch and stuff there if you want to go look at some T-shirts. And uh, wherever you're listening to it, make sure you subscribe, you share it, you review it. Help us spread the word, spread the love. Um, we love that you're hanging out with us. This is, this is a lot of fun. So that will do it, though. So goodbye. Bye.